Okay, our passage this morning comes from 1 John. We're going to start at chapter 2, verse 28, and then we will read through chapter 3, verse 10. So hear with me the word of the Lord. Let's, let's pray before we read. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Uh, as always, Lord, thank you. Um, as Preston said, the gospel has gone forth in, in many ways already this morning. Uh, and so we pray now for this uh, hearing of your word as it is read and preached. Lord, we pray uh, for your Holy Spirit uh, to, to be upon us, uh, to soften our hearts, to open our ears. Uh, Lord, speak to us this morning, we pray. Uh, and, and whatever it is that you have to say to us, we pray that you would make us open to hear it, to receive it. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, uh, that you still speak to us um, as your servants, as your children, as we'll see this morning. And we ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Starting at verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. and They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are, and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, uh, we continue today in our look at 1 John, and uh, it's been a couple weeks. We had a guest preacher last week, so we're going to just uh, review very quickly uh, what we've been talking about so far. Uh, we remember that this, this is a letter, or it's almost a sermon, that was written by Jesus' beloved disciple, the, the same one who wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, he wrote this near the end of a lifetime of, of ministry and of mission. And he's writing to this community, this, this church, that he knows well, that he has deep, deep feelings of love and affection for. So you want to remember that as we read through this. These are people that John loves and cares for. And they are going through a difficult time as a church. There, there is inner conflict and division uh, that is happening in their congregation. Perhaps some of you have been a part of a church that has experienced things like that before. And you know how painful that can be uh, when there is inner conflict and division in a church, when people People are, are splitting from one another, and that's what's happening in this church. Uh, there is false teaching that has been being spread, and it's been uh, working their way its way into this community, uh, and it's been affecting people's understandings of the gospel. There's been false teachings about who Jesus is. Uh, there's been false teachings about the nature of sin and how it affects people. Uh, there's been false teaching about uh, salvation, calling people into question. Are they saved? Are they not? How do we know? And so these are things that hit deep at the heart of what the Christian life is all about. And so even though these people have left, that even though they've moved on from this community, the effects of what they have done and said are still being felt within that community and they're still being wrestled with. Uh, they're, they're still creating issues and divisions, creating doubts in people's minds about the things that they have been taught and about what is true. And so John is writing this to to encourage them and to assure them of the truth, 
uh, of the truth that they have already learned. He wants to set them uh, straight in what they believe and how they are living together, but in, but in a positive way to say that you can know that you are walking in the light. Uh, this is the verse that we, we looked at in uh, chapter one of this, uh, of this book and the theme of our sermon series, that you can walk in the light and you can know if you are walking in the light. You can know if you are living according to God's truth. And so the, he lays out for us through this book ways that we can know that you are doing these things. And so we wanna go about identifying these as we go through this book, uh, ways of walking in the light according according to John. How do we know? And John says, here are some things that are identifiers for you. Now, you have to be careful with these. We're going to put these up here uh, in just a minute. You have to be careful always because this could become another law, right? This can be another another way of saying, well, I, I must do these things, and if I can just tick these off the box, then I know that I'm, I'm doing right and I'll, and I'll be saved. And that's not the point. The point is more to say, look at your life. Are these things in your life? Do, are, are they demonstrated in your life? And if so, then you can be sure that you have a solid relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, that you are walking in the light of his truth. I was listening to, to another uh, sermon on, uh, on 1 John earlier this week, and somebody pointed out, which I thought was helpful, if you're asking these questions, then you probably are in a good place already. If you are concerned about whether or not you are walking in the light, that is a good sign. Uh, that you want to be in a good place with Jesus Christ. And so take courage even in that. If you're thinking, how can I know? How can I know if I'm walking in the light? Well, even that is a sign that you are concerned about these things, right? And that you want the light of God to shine in your life. So here are the things that we've seen so far. We're gonna put five up that we've identified so far as we've gone through these. You can look back if you you wanna quibble with me about these things, that's fine. But I think you can look back in 1 John and see these things. So the first one is this, we confess our sin. We confess our sin. We're going to talk about that again in in just a few minutes because of, of some of the things that are said in our passage today. But John says, look, you have to acknowledge your sin before God. You have to confess your sin. And when you do that, then God is gracious and just to forgive your sin and purify you from all unrighteousness. So this is one of the first things, to acknowledge that we are sinners before God. If you want to walk in the light, that's one of the first steps that you can take. Uh, This is one of the things when I asked Anna and Katie this morning, Uh, to affirm their faith, we want to say, do you acknowledge yourself a sinner before God or acknowledging yourself as a sinner before God in need of his grace? Do you believe in him as your Lord and Savior? So confess your sin. The second one is this, obey God's commands, right? God has has told us. He said, here is the way. Walk ye in it, right? Here, Here is how you can live in the fullness of life. I have showed it to you, right? Do we want to live that way? Are you obeying God's commands? We know we fall short, but, but is there a sense in which you want to, that you want to live this way, that you want to follow God's commands, okay? So that's the second one, love one another. And this is the specific command, right? He says obey God's commands, but there's a specific command that John is particularly concerned about, which is that we love one another, that this is an important one. Are we loving one another in the body of Christ? And John says, look, if you say you love God and you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ, then you're lying to yourself, right? And so this is how important it is. This is how important it is. So do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or at least do you want to love your brothers and sisters in Christ? That's, that's a good place to start, okay? Uh, next is this, do not love the world, right? Do not love the world. Now, that doesn't mean we can't enjoy God's good creation, all of the things that God has given us, his gifts. What it means is that we don't love the world in its brokenness, its sin, its rebellion against God, right? The world is kind of like us in that way, right? We, we were created good, created in God's image. The world was created good. God has given it to us as a gift. And yet, at the same time, it has been affected by sin. It's broken. It's sinful. And, and John is saying, look, we don't want to love the sinfulness of the world, the rebellion of the world, the things that would pull us away from God, okay? And then the last one is this, believe in Jesus. Now, when we, when we preached on this a couple of weeks ago, we said believe in the incarnation, right? And that's important, but this is, this is what he's saying. You want to believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus is who the scriptures say he is. So we want to believe in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Messiah, the Son of God made flesh, who was born of a virgin, who came and lived here on this earth, lived a sinless life, and then who was 
crucified on the cross to pay for our sins and then raised to new life on the third day. Okay, so this is, this is the creed, right? This is what we want to believe. And it says, look, if you need to believe this. If you want to be walking in the light, these are the things you need to believe about Jesus Christ, right? He is the long-awaited Messiah, the one that God has promised throughout the Old Testament that, that Israel had been waiting for for so long. And so the reason he emphasizes this is because the false teachers were coming in and saying, you don't really have to believe these things about Jesus. This isn't who he really was. So he wants to say, no, believe who Jesus said he was, the incarnate son of God, the Messiah of God. So we want to believe these things. What I like about this list is I think we see a couple of things here, that there's an emphasis both on what we believe and on what we do, right? There's an emphasis on this list and about what we believe and what we do. There's a, there's a doctrine piece of this and an action piece of this, right? We need to believe in Jesus, that he's the incarnate son of God, but we also want to confess our sin, to acknowledge ourselves as sinners. We want to obey God's commands. We want to love one another and not love the world, okay? So there's doctrine and action in, bo- in this list. The reason I like that is because I think sometimes as Christians, we tend to emphasize one of those things over the other. We tend to put too much emphasis in one place. We say, no, it's all about what you believe. That's the only thing that matters. It's our doctrine. That's the thing that matters. And in one sense, that's right. But some people want to say, no, it's our actions. Are we following Jesus? Are we doing what he said? Loving our neighbors as ourselves, that's the most important thing. And so what John does here is to stress the importance of both of these things. Is what's really important that we have the right doctrine of the atonement? Well, that's important, right? Or is it caring for the poor? Is that the most important thing? Well, that's important too. We want to hold these things together in the Christian life. This is very important. Uh, I like, you guys know I like Eugene Peterson, if you've been coming here for very long. He had a great quote on this. He was sort of speaking to this idea specifically about how it plays out in the United States of America. Uh, I, I would imagine it plays out in other ways, but he said this. He said, it isn't social action versus personal salvation. A half-truth is not a truth. Both sides are wrong to focus on one or the other. It's both. We have too many one-legged Christians walking around. I like that. We have too many one-legged Christians walking around who put one, too much emphasis on one over the other. So, of course, these things go together. What we believe about Jesus, our doctrine, is going to influence our actions and how we live, how we play these things out. And with all of this, with all of this, we want to remember that we need to rely on the grace of God and Jesus Christ and put our trust there. That's the place we want to put our trust. So this is our review for this morning. This is what we've seen so far, okay? How we can be assured that we are walking in the light. Do you see these things in your life in some way? So then today's passage, uh, the one we just read, it starts with an imperative, with an instruction, with something to do. After John talks about who Jesus is and, and tells us that by believing in him, we have fellowship with him and with the Father, he says that we should remain in him. We should remain in him. We should continue in him. Uh, a lot of translations, and what I like is it says we should abide in him. This may be the word that you all have used. ESV says it this way, and now little children, abide in in him. This word abide, it has lots of of connotations to it, lots of ways that we could think about what it means. It means it it can mean to live, to live in him, to stay, to to stick with, to take up residence, right? Uh, All of these can be uh, sort of meanings of this same word abide, that we want to stick with Jesus and not leave him, abide in him. And when we hear this, the reason I like the word abide is because I think it points us back to John's gospel. And the well-known passage in John chapter 15. It was one of the first passages that I, that I memorized in my church growing up was, was uh, John chapter 15 about the vine and the branches. And many of you are familiar, I think, with this passage. And it talks all about what it means to abide in Christ. And this is what uh, John says, just a few selections from John chapter 15. Verse 5 says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Talking about the life of faith. So abide in me. Verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then verse 12, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. You can see how uh, 1 John, in many ways, lines up with this passage from John's Gospel, John chapter 15. You can read those next to each other, and and they can almost be commentaries uh, for each other. But we see the same themes repeated here in John's Gospel, as we see in 1 John, that we want to abide in Christ. We want to abide in the Father's love. By following his commandments, we abide in his love. And this is his commandment, that we should love one another. Abiding will bring these things about naturally. This is the fruit of abiding in Christ, that we would keep his commandments. If we abide in him, we will keep his commandments. One commandment in particular that he's concerned with is love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you should love one another. We even saw that this is how our passage in 1 John ended today. And the source of all of this is, is the love of the Father for us in Jesus Christ. He is the vine, we are the branches, and we want to abide in him, and that will produce fruit in our lives. We want to remember that. It's not to say that we don't participate in this in some way, but if we're out there trying to do all kinds of good deeds and we lose our connection with the Father, then we're not going to be able to do anything. This is what he says. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the first priority should always be that we abide in Christ, that we abide in the Father's love. Just as as the Father has loved Jesus, Jesus loves us. So we want to abide in him. So this is point number six. As we look at ways of walking in the light, we're going to add this one to our list. Number six, abide in him, okay? Abide in him. If you are abiding in him, you are walking in the light. So again, remain in him, continue in him, stick with him. Do not leave him, but stay with him. Take up residence with Christ. Live life in fellowship with him. Early in in this letter, John says that one of his purposes for writing is because he wants the people that are, are reading his letter, his audience, to have fellowship with each other and to have fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And he's encouraging them to abide in that fellowship that they have with the Father and the Son. So John moves from this instruction staying abide in him and then he wants to talk about who we are in Christ. He moves to a section talking about us being children of God and saying this is our identity. And that's what I want our main focus to be this morning. Uh, I love the way that John starts here. It's not just what he says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, but it's how he says it because you can feel his enthusiasm. You can feel his enthusiasm. And by the way, as we talk about children of God, and, and we've sort of said this already this morning, um, this is what we were celebrating with the baptism this morning, right? With Katie and with Anna, what we are celebrating with them is that they are children of God. They've been given this new identity in Christ uh, with God as their heavenly father. This is, this is what baptism signifies for them and for each one of us. And so as we talk about this, we, can, we even had a picture of that this morning, that they were being baptized into this new identity in God. So, Here's what 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says. And again, uh, I love the way that John says it, but he says this. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. That is what we are. Uh, I'm an American. Uh, that may be obvious. Thank you. I know. Uh, one of the things that I've learned as I've moved to the United States, uh, away from the United States to Europe, is that Americans like to use exclamation points. Has anybody noticed that? Uh, we use exclamation points more than other cultures do. In the United States, if you send a text to somebody and there's not at least two exclamation points at the end, then they think, why is Mike mad at me? Right? This is the way, this is the way it has to be. Maybe some emojis, smiley faces, things of that nature. What I've realized is that in other cultures, if you send a message with an exclamation point, people think, why is Mike mad at me, right? There's this this different kind of emphasis here. Now, the reason I share this is because we want to read what John is saying here. 80, 90-year-old John, who has experienced the love of God from the time he was a young man walking with Jesus, right? 
And yet here he is still astounded by the fact that God has lavished his love on us to the extent that we could be called God's children. There are lots of exclamation points that John wants to put in what he's saying here, right? We should read this with lots of enthusiasm, lots of emphasis. He even says it again. He says, and that is what we are. Let me say exactly the same thing again. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, has poured out on us in abundance, that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are. That is what we are. Friends, never, never, never stop being astonished by that. Never stop being astonished by that. This is what God has called us, right? John speaks about this in his gospel as well. John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There is so much good news in what John is saying here, that we are God's children. And there are two ways that we, can, we see it, that we want to look at this morning, uh, the way that this is good news for us. And the first one is this, that there is a, there is a change of status that happens here when we become God's children. There was something that we were not that now we are, right? There's something that we were not that now we are. We are now God's children in, in sort of a legal sense, and a, a sense in which we have the inheritance. Carol read that passage this morning, this verse, where she said, we have an inheritance that will never sp- uh, spoil, perish, or fade that is kept in heaven for us, right? We have been made God's children, and because of that, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And all that belongs to Jesus also belongs to us because we have been adopted as God's children, right? This is a beautiful thing. Our status has changed before God because we have been made his children. We are something that we weren't before. John talks about this as being born again of God. You've heard that phrase before maybe, that we are born again of the spirit, that we are born of God. Paul talks about the idea of adoption, that we have been adopted as God's children in Jesus Christ. So we have this change of status, right? God is now our father in a very real way. We can say this. But also the good news comes not just in this status change, but also in the relationship that we now have with God, our Heavenly Father. Because fatherhood is about a lot more than a status, a legal status that we have, right? It's not just about an inheritance, as good as this is, but the real reward that comes in this kind of relationship is the relationship itself. A father delighting in his children, and vice versa. Children delighting in their loving father. We have fellowship with the father and the Son. We have fellowship with the Father through the Son. So you might think of the way that children are with a loving parent. And I know not all of us have had the gift of experiencing this, okay? So hopefully you've at least witnessed this in someone's life. But you think about the way that children are with a loving parent, and the freedom, and the joy, and the confidence and the boldness that those children have in approaching their parent, right? Uh, I'd like, I like to think that I'm a loving father and probably shouldn't use myself as the best example, but I will say that when one of my children wakes up in the middle of the night, they have no qualms about just coming straight into our room and waking us up and telling us what's going on, right? Because there's a boldness there. There's a confidence there. They, they know that they are going to be received mostly kindly, depending on what hour of the night it is, right? There's a joy and a confidence in that. And hopefully this is the experience that we have with our earthly fathers too. But we have this with our heavenly father. When children are secure in that relationship that they have with that parent, when they know that they are loved and accepted, it affects everything about the way that they go about their lives. And John is telling us that this is what it can be like with God, who is our heavenly father. In Christ, he has made us his children. Friends, this is what the cross has given to us. When Jesus died on that cross, he took our place and took the punishment that was ours in order that we could have the inheritance that belonged to him. He gave us that, this status as God's children. 
It's not just about the release uh, of the eternal consequences of our sin, but now we have a new kind of relationship with God, one that is defined by his love and affection for us, a love that John says he has lavished on us. He has poured it out in abundance, more than we can even comprehend, more than we could ask or imagine. And so now we can approach God, our Heavenly Father, in the freedom and joy and confidence and boldness of knowing that He loves us and delights in us. When we wake up in the middle of the night troubled by something, we can go to our Heavenly Father and talk to Him about it in the middle of the night. I was talking with uh, Frank about that earlier this week, right? There is nothing that keeps us from going to our Father when we wake up in the middle of the night troubled by something and telling him what is going on and knowing that we will be accepted and loved and received well. We can approach him in this way. Friends, even when we mess up, even when we sin, maybe perhaps especially when we mess up and when we sin, then we can come to him to confess and to repent, confident that there is forgiveness and restoration waiting for us us. And the nature of this relationship is determined by God's character. It's determined by God's character. God is holy and good and just, and he is loving and gracious and merciful. Preston used this verse before he prayed. We didn't, we didn't line up notes on this, right? But this is the character of God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, right? This is what our heavenly father is like. See how much God loves us. Friends, see, behold, look at how much God loves us that we should be called his children. And that is what we are with lots of exclamation points. Friends, this is good news. This is good news. It is overwhelming good news. So God, John goes on to say that we are indeed God's children. We're going to come back to this idea. We're going to end there. But John goes on to say that we are indeed God's children and, and wants to emphasize it one more time. We are indeed God's children. And then he says, what we will be has not yet been made known. We don't have, we don't have a full understanding of what that means for us yet. We can't comprehend it. We can't get our minds around it. It has not been fully made known. But he says, but when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And this points to something that we look forward to, a future promise of the Christian life, that one day Jesus will come back, and when he does, we will experience the fullness of our fellowship with him and with the Father. And whatever else we look forward to about heaven, and I know a lot of us have ideas in our head of what heaven is going to be like, but whatever else we look forward to about heaven or eternal life, this should be the main thing, the fullness of fellowship that we have with the Father and the Son. That's what we get to look forward to, to be truly with him, to see him as he really is. Not that what we have with him now isn't real and true and good, it is, but it isn't yet what it fully can be. This is an imperfect analogy, hear me, it's an imperfect analogy, I know this, but it's like the difference between keeping up a relationship with someone strictly through calls and through texts and through writing, and then you get to really be with someone. And to live in their presence, to take up residence with them, to abide with them. Think about the difference of of those kinds of relationships. And this is what we have to look forward to. The fullness of abiding in Christ. And fullness of being in his presence. Of living with him in this way. The point is that as good as our fellowship is with him now, there is still more waiting for us that is more and fuller and better. And this is an idea that runs through all of Scripture. The desire to experience the fullness of fellowship with God, to see his face and to know him as he truly is. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, he says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And when we go all the way back to the Old Testament, we can look at Psalm 27, and David is writing here, and he says, One thing that I ask from the Lord, and this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, 
and to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to see him in his temple. David wants to abide in the presence of God. And then he goes on to say this, my heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. What we have here from from both Paul and from David, what John is expressing as well is is longing and desire. It's what C.S. Lewis calls, uh, often describes as a longing for home. It's longing for the place where we belong. The place of fully knowing, just as we are fully known by God, our Heavenly Father. This is what we want. This is what we look forward to. And when we do see him fully as he is, when we see him face to face, which is what we will get to do one day, then we will be changed. We will be transformed. John says here that we will be like him, righteous, fully free from sin. This is, this is a transformation that is already at work in us by God's Holy Spirit. There is no question. God is already working in us, forming us into the likeness of Christ, renewing his image of us. This is what happens when we abide in him, when we walk in the light. God is working in us. God is constantly at work in us. There is an internal transformation that is happening in us. Uh, the, the, the philosopher Dallas Willard calls it a renovation of the heart. This is what God is doing in us already. But what we know and experience now isn't the fullness of what will be. And when we see him as he is in the fullness of his glory, we will be fully changed by it, irreversibly changed by it. If our faith is in Jesus Christ, then we look forward to that great day. So John goes on here to talk about what this looks like, how how it plays out in the life of a follower of Christ. And he reflects on sin, saying, no one who lives in sin, excuse me, who lives in Christ keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. And he says, if we've been born of God, then we cannot go on sinning. Now, We need to address these verses. We need to address these verses. There's a way to read this that would lead to a view that says that we can be rid of sin in this life. And if we're really in Christ, then that would already be the case. And if that interpretation of these passages is not true, then we are all in trouble, okay? We are all in trouble. Uh, This is where it is good for us to remember that we are to look at the whole counsel of Scripture, And we should never just pick one or two verses and build our whole system of belief on one or two verses. We want to remember that John has already told us in this letter at the very beginning saying that if any one of us says that we are without sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And Paul says in Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. People interpret what John is getting at here in different ways, but the point is to say that if you have been born again from God, then you can't continue to pursue a life of sin. They are incompatible, okay? They are incompatible. But there is a difference between continuing to struggle with sin, which we all do, and continuing to pursue and embrace sin. There's a difference between those things. You can walk in darkness or you can walk in the light. These are the things that John lays before us. You can walk in darkness, or you can walk in the light. You can't have it both ways. You can live according to God's truth, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, or you can live according to the devil's lies, which Jesus came to conquer and to destroy, as our passage says today. But you can't have it both ways. You can abide in Christ, or you can abide in sin, but you can't have it both ways. So which is it going to be? Which is it going to be? John exhorts us to abide in him, to walk in the light, to be God's child, to embrace that identity that he has given to us. I want to close today uh, by going back to this idea of being God's child, that, that this is who we are. This is who we are. And I want us to leave here today reflecting on that idea, that this is our identity. We are God's child. Uh, several years ago, uh, as, as we were going through the adoption process with James, I came across a book that was called 
not by nature, but by grace. It was written by a, a theologian named Gilbert Mylander in the United States, and it, it's a, a theological reflection on birth, on adoption, on families. And, and the chapters had these different theological reflections, but interspersed with these different chapters uh, were these letters that he had written to his son, Derek, about what it meant to have adopted him to have brought him into his family, to have made him his son, and what he learned from that about God's love for him. So this goes along more with Paul's idea of being adopted, of adoption. and This is, this is our new identity in Christ. But the idea is the same as John's, of being born again of God, that in Christ, God makes us his children that God brings us into his family. So I'm going to read this. It's a little bit long, but I think it's important to to hear most of this letter. I don't read the whole thing, but most of this letter. And it's called uh, Adoptees One and All. He writes this. Dear Derek, I wrote last time that being adopted makes you different. And so it does. But I also hinted that we still had one more thing to think about in order to really get the proper theological perspective on adoption. Has it occurred to you that every Christian is adopted? That's what St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 4. That God sent his son Jesus, Paul writes, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because we have become God's children by adoption, he has sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And each one of us has been rescued from our natural state. Each has experienced the love of a new and better father. Each has become part of a new and better family. So you might think of your own experience of being adopted as an image, inadequate and hazy to be sure, of what each of us can and must experience if we are really to flourish as human beings made to know the love of God. By God's grace, we are all adoptees. He goes on to say this, I think, in fact, that having you for a son has taught me this more clearly than years of theological study. If someone had asked me 20 years ago whether I could love a child who was not my biological child as much as one who was, I would have said that I doubted it. The biological tie seemed so important and is so important that I just couldn't imagine the lack of it could be overcome. You have taught me that I was wrong. For I know I love you every bit as much as Peter, Ellen, or Hannah. So thanks to you, I've learned something about myself. But more important, I've learned a crucial theological lesson. We might say that biological parents are, in a way, obligated to love their children, while adoptive parents do not act from obligation. There's something to that, and and precisely because there is, we should remember that God is under no obligation to love us and does not love us because he must. Why then does he love us? Well, I can answer, how can I answer that question except with another Why do I love you? Just because I do. And likewise, just because God does. We have no claims on God. We cannot plead the importance of biological kinship. We can only learn to be grateful that for his own mysterious reasons, he has adopted us as his children. I like to think that this is a lesson you will not forget. It will, I think, make you yourself a better father someday. I hope I'm around to see that day because I have every confidence that you'll be a good one. Love, Dad. Friends, look, behold, see what love the Father has lavished on us. He has poured it out abundantly on us, given us an excess of it. Lots of exclamation points here that we should be called his children. And in Christ, that is who we are. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, what else can we say but thank you? Thank you. Thank you for the great love that you have lavished on us in your son, Jesus Christ. 
that we might be called your children. And that all that belongs to Jesus belongs to us because of that. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you in, in joy and in boldness and in confidence, knowing that, that you love us and accept us as your children. Lord, we pray that we would always approach you that way. That we might delight in you as you delight in us. We thank you for all of this and, and pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.